right, guys, welcome back to another video. We have some pretty exciting stuff to talk about today after all of the Hellblade 2 previews started dropping. We got a lot more information about the game. We're going to get into that. But before we do, if you are new to the channel or if you've been watching for a while and aren't subscribed, hit that subscribe button, help the channel grow and make sure to check out my Spotify in the link in the description. So Hellblade 2. It's around the corner releasing May 21st, and this game is shaping up to be potentially the best looking game that we have gotten on this generation of consoles. Everything we've seen from behind the scenes of Ninja Theory and how they're creating this game, just a super extremely realistic, a smaller, more cinematic experience. Actually, they're saying now it's roughly around the same length as the first game, so around eight hours, which to me is absolutely fine, especially with the fact that they are pricing it at $50, but it looks Looks like it is going to be a game that you're going to want to be showing off to all of your friends anytime somebody comes over as a showpiece as to what these consoles can actually do graphically and that question as to whether these consoles have been giving us everything yet after they've been giving us the, the full power that, that have been promised when it comes to what the graphics we were going to be seeing on the xbox series x and the ps5 i think a lot of people are still wanting more and hellblade 2 may be that experience that finally gives us that we got a bunch of previews here all of the the main major big outlets were the ones i got the hands on i got to play hellblade 2 and then give information about what to expect from this game and there's a nice preview here from Clobro just kind of breaking down everything that we did learn so I'll quickly go over this it says Unreal Engine 5 visual benchmark possibly one of the best looking games ever so ever made I mean if you watch some of the gameplay especially now that we see more of it the combat and everything a lot more fluid very very gory and a lot more animations when you are going through and fighting each enemy they say it's fully mo-capped fighting system so if you go look at some of their previews they have some back behind the scenes footage and every single fight from what i understand when i watch the previews where that every animation everything you're going to be seeing when you're taking on enemies was all mocap. This was something they took a lot of time doing, I believe 70 hours or so to get all of the different moves within the game. And they compared to how long it took them with the first Hellblade and it was far less than that. And they were in a studio where the swords would actually hit the roof with the first Hellblade. But obviously now being purchased by Microsoft, having a first successful game, way more funding, way more resources, and they can go out and give us something truly exceptional. And that was one of my biggest things here with Hellblade 2 is how were they going to take advantage of now being backed by a trillion dollar company in Microsoft and a huge company like Xbox to give us that just insanely upgraded experience over the first game and from the what we're seeing from the combat which was my biggest gripe with the first game it really looks like they have improved on it in fact they say here combat is one-on-one -on -one only slow paced and very brutal so if you go again watch some of those preview videos you see you're taking out one enemy at a time there's stuff going on around you but you're only fighting one person and then somebody will come in grab you from behind and you'll switch enemies and you'll take on another enemy so very cool it's very all about that cinematic experience when playing through it they say swinging your sword always feel heavy and impactful it's a true next gen experience 30 fps on the xbox series x and s and of course this is going to be probably the biggest talking point for a lot of people who are detractors of this game or potentially just disappointed about seeing 30 fps on the xbox series x and s and specifically when it comes to the 30 fps in the game pro article here it says hellblade 2 only runs at 30 fps and dynamic resolution on both the xbox series s and the xbox series x there are no graphics modes, so you're only getting that one mode. The frame rate can only be increased on the PC. The VFX director explains this in an interview with GamePro by saying that the experience should feel more cinematic, similar to movies that run at 24 frames per second. So that is what they're going for here. That is why it is locked at 30 frames per second. And obviously, logically, you would think, well, if you can raise the frame rates on PC, why didn't they give consoles that performance mode? And my guess would be is that... It couldn't get as stable enough. They want to make sure the people who are playing this game, no matter where they are, getting that fully cinematic experience. And they don't want people just going in there, unlocking the frame rate or putting the 60 FPS and having jitteries and, and shutters everywhere. So 
That's probably why, but you're going to have that argument that people will want that performance option. Just give them that choice. And honestly, I would agree with that. I would say, give them the choice. It's up to them. And then they will go back and forth between the modes and probably end up realizing if you're playing on the console itself, that the best way to play this game is in 30 FPS. And this isn't anything new right now, as we've kind of been seeing this over the last little while where you have games like Final Fantasy VII Remake, which was having frame rate issues. You have Dragon's Dogma with frame rate issues. And now here with Hellblade 2 being locked at 30 frames per second to give you that full cinematic experience. And it's not a very fast game. If you've ever played the first Hellblade, it's a lot of puzzles, very slow moving. The combat itself is also very slow. So I don't think it's going to be bad for the experience playing this in 30 frames per second and where the emphasis is is going to be and where people are going to want it to be is going to be on that graphical fidelity and the ultimate realism of how this game does look now for me again i played starfield at 30 fps on the xbox i don't really care that much i'm gonna be playing this at 30 fps it doesn't really bother me but there will be a lot of people upset and a lot of people discussing this over the lead up to hellblade 2 which i kind of think is it gonna probably unfair from what we've seen from this game this is a game that you could tell Xbox is very, very confident in giving out all of these previews over a month ahead before it's released. They, they believe that this is probably going to be one of those huge games for Xbox that everyone's going to be talking about and showing off as a reason to go out and buy an Xbox console and get into the Xbox ecosystem. They say here when it comes to the audio features industry leading by neural audio as uh, overall narrative. And when it comes to the narrative overall, it's a linear action experience with very high production value focuses on story and cinematic craft, impactful combat and puzzles. Game is releasing on Xbox PC on day one in Xbox Game Pass on May 21st, 2024. So there you have it. Game does look phenomenal. Uh, if you've watched my channel before, I I've said it many times. I was not the biggest fan of the first Hellblade. I did find it pretty boring with the puzzles and the combat was just kind of sluggish, but I could definitely see what they were going for. I thought they had a really cool narrative experience within that game. To me, it is kind of more of that narrative movie style experience. And I think this is just going to take it to the next level if that's the type of experience you are looking for. And again, go watch those previews. You will see graphically. I don't... I can't think on top of my head any game that is really has matched it in recent memory. I mean, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora is one of the best looking games I've ever seen as well that came out last year, but that's more open world. So it's not as impressive in terms of all of the details that we're seeing here in Hellblade because they're really able to hone in on everything with it being a much smaller experience. So I think this is going to be very, very cool. And it's probably one of those games, even if you have it on PC and you're able to increase the frame rate slightly, probably one of those games you're going to want to have on a big screen TV, sitting back on a couch with some good audio experience and playing it. So I'll be looking forward to it. I will absolutely be jumping into Hellblade 2 when it does launch on May 21st, 2024. And it's nice to see them getting these previews out and actually give a worthy marketing campaign for this first party Xbox game, which they kind of miss a decent amount of time, Xbox and their marketing teams. They don't do a great job of marketing their stuff, but this one right now, I think most people walked away from seeing those previews in awe as to what was being shown off. And continuing here with some more Hellblade 2 news here, because th there was lots that did come out yesterday. Don Matthews comments on the price, the size of the game, and he, that is the head of Ninja Theory saying this. I think what we always set out to do is to tell a story and for the game length to be appropriate for the story that we want to tell. I think it is. There is a story that we want to tell here with a beginning, middle, and end. And what is the right shape and size of experience to tell that story? So that's kind of where we start. So I'm really pleased to see that there's lots of people that actually enjoy a shorter experience something that they can sit down on a, a whatever friday night stick their headphones on turn the lights off and kind of sink into an experience and players who don't necessarily want something that's 50 hours long 100 hours long so it's as long as it needs to be and i'm one of those people i like shorter games i think there's a lot of pressure on people's time these days and i think our fans from what we hear from them they enjoy a shorter game where our intention is that every step of the journey is meaningful there's an audience of people that want games that are focused and i would absolutely agree with that i mean as more games are coming out it is becoming just so daunting to realize that your backlog is filled with 50 to 100 hour games how are you ever going to get through them especially if you're somebody whose time is more limited so when you get these nicer shorter experiences it makes you kind of feel more accomplished that you're actually able to complete that game in a reasonable amount of time so there's definitely an audience for that 
And overall, I mean, the way that we've seen the industry right now with the increasing development costs and the layoffs and the IPs being canceled and the studio closures, I think we will start getting back to more of those shorter games, kind of back to the 360 era where there were those 10 hour awesome experiences. And there are a lot of them. So you could go through multiple different games rather than just focusing on that one game for 50 to 100 hours. And one thing here with Hellblade 2 is it is $50. It is digital only, which for the physical fans out there like myself, that is kind of disappointing, but it is $50, which that's the benefit to me of an all digital experience is start reducing the prices of these games because you're not spending the money of actually creating the case and shipping them and all those logistics. You're just literally putting that digital file onto a storefront. So hopefully that's kind of the trend we do start to see. I, I'm kind of doubtful. I feel like gamers have already proven they're willing to pay $70 for digital games. So I don't see why most publishers would start reducing their prices because they already have all the data that, Hey, if people are going to be buying Madden, people are going to be buying call of duty, all these annual release games at $70 full price, sometimes even more with these deluxe editions. I don't see why publishers would ever start reducing the actual cost of their all digital games. But yeah, that's where they believe their fans or what they believe their fans want is those smaller, more meaningful experiences. And when it comes to Ninja Theory as well, the co-founder, this all came out yesterday. It's all crazy. All the news that dropped for it. The co-founder for Ninja Theory, Tamim Antonadis, has left the studio. Seems like kind of an odd time to leave the studio. Just before the release, maybe his time is done there with his the creative vision. Hellblade 2 is, has come to an end, so he's walking away. But you think you kind of want to stay around for the launch and just how it is taken in by the general public. But it says here, on a recent visit to Cambridge UK-based studio for Hellblade 2 preview, Polygon noted that there was no sign or mention of Antonides, who was formerly the company's chief creative director, spokesperson for Xbox, which owns the studio, later confirmed thus to the site that Antonides was no longer with the developer. So that's pretty much it. That's all we know. He's not there anymore. We don't know what his next plans are, if he's going to open a new studio, if he's been hired by somebody else and going to go work for somebody else, or if he's just going to be leaving games altogether. But it'll be an interesting thing to track because he's done great work, worked on Ninja Theory with... Uh, awesome games heavenly sword enslaved odyssey to the west dmc devil may cry and then obviously hellblade Senua sacrifice so we'll see what is next here for to me okay let's jump over here because we also got some news that dropped for gear six and this was on the kind of funny x cast which is kind of interesting because you think about kind of funny and they were the ones that did not want to report on any information about insomnia because it was a leak or anything like that and now, but no problem here reporting on a leak or a scoop that has not been announced yet by Xbox themselves with Gear 6. And it's nothing big. It's essentially just it's Jeff Grubb was on XCast and saying that we may hear something about Gear 6 this summer. It says here, during the last episode of Kind of Funny X-Cast, Paris Lilly made a prediction that Gear 6 news would arrive in the summer, a prediction which was then seemingly verified by the episode's guest, Giant Bomb's Jeff Grubb, saying when they showed the Marvel 1943 trailer in Unreal Engine 5 during GDC, I jokingly tweeted, imagine what Gear 6 would look like in Unreal 5 because it looked so good. I think Gear 6 is going to look phenomenal. Like Hellblade 2, probably the best looking game or one of the best looking games we're going to see. I feel like Gear 6 could end up matching that with the work that the Coalition does. I mean, just go back and still look at how good Gears 5 is all of these years later. It's pretty insane. So now imagining what they can do in Unreal Engine 5 with the new technology and and the whole backing of everything that they have uh, is going to be pretty crazy. And then it continues on here. It says, and then somebody from the Coalition made a cryptic little subtweet under me about that, which perked my ears on that. So my conspiracy theory is that you, you do tease it this year and then it's probably a launch game for next gen. That seems to make sense to me. So that was his claim. And then Jeff Grubb here says, I've heard some stuff with gear six might be happening this summer. So whatever that means, probably a teaser trailer as to what the game is going to look like and kind of a, a glimpse at the plot going forward and the characters that we all love from gear. So we'll see. I wouldn't be surprised just to give us like that excitement of the insane amounts of fidelity and they send work that the coalition will be doing with gear six you gotta remember they also worked on that matrix demo they were a part of that and that was pretty crazy so gear six 
probably my most anticipated Xbox game right now going forward as I'm a massive, massive Gears fan. All right, jumping over here to some exciting news. This is finally happening. People were wanting a new Splinter Cell or a remake, just bringing Splinter Cell back as its own standalone game for the longest time. And we know that Ubisoft Toronto now is working on Splinter Cell remake. And then yesterday we got the announcement for Ubisoft for 2024 that is coming this summer in June. And it looks like we may potentially be getting an update on this game. I'm hoping gameplay or maybe a, a small trailer as to what we can expect from it as Ubisoft Toronto changed their Facebook header to a Splinter Cell profile right after the announcement of Ubisoft Ford, which would probably make you guess here that they are gearing up for that vertical slice or something along those lines to show us and give us more for Splinter Cell Remake. This has been a no-brainer for so long to bring back Splinter Cell. Now, this is a remake. I'm hoping that they actually make a brand new Splinter Cell game in the future. To me, again, that's also a no-brainer with the amount of fans that would that want it, that would most likely jump in and play it. I think they would make a ton of money off of that. So maybe there will be more information, more announcements for Splinter Cell at this year's Ubisoft Forward. All right, a couple more things here. Embracer Group, apparently you're not supposed to bet against them now, even though they've done all this downsizing and, and layoffs and IPs being canceled and studio closures. But Saber Interactive, who recently just spinned off of Embracer Group, they left, are saying to not bet against the Embracer Group. This says here, Saber Interactive founder Matthew Karch has launched a defense of a former employer Embracer Group CEO, Lars Wakeforce. And I mean, for good reason, people have questioned Lars. People have questioned the Embracer Group in what they are truly trying to do here in the gaming industry. A lot of people look at the Embracer Group as a negative on the gaming industry because of all of the stuff that has been happening. But Saber Interactive and Matthew Karch seemingly does not believe that. He says this, there was a long time when Lars was kind of a wonder child. He could do no wrong. He was on the cover of magazines and Lars is a pretty humble guy. It's not like he takes all of his money and spends it. Yes, he bought a few things that people with wealth can buy, but he's been very maligned in Sweden in particular. First, he was maligned for actually being wealthy. And then he was maligned for the fact that the Embracer shares haven't really held up over the past year. In fact, they dropped significantly and precipitously. And I think it actually dropped more on a relative basis than almost anybody else, primarily because it seems to be a company these days that everyone likes to pick on. Well, they've been picking on Embracer for good reason. I mean, if you look at what has happened with their studios, again, with the games and the layoffs, there's, there's a reason why people are picking on it. Continues here said in saying, but in my mind, nobody has been guided by more of a sense of fairness and reasonableness than Lars. The process that we've had to go through to terminate studios has absolutely been it's killed us. I say us, even though I'm no longer part of the company because I feel like I mean I still have shares, I still have close relationship with good friends, and obviously the best wishes that they succeed over there. But I would say Bracer tried harder than anybody to save as many jobs as it could. So there you have it. I mean, that is coming from Matthew Karch saying give them a chance and that people are being too hard on them and, and i would say well until they start proving that they are going to actually do some good things for the gaming industry i feel like it is totally justified to be hard on the embracer group now he also continues on here and says i blame being a publicly traded company for some of the woes that embracer has and i blame the fact that people are trying to take advantage of other people's misery through shorting the stock as something that has resulted in a depressed share price for the company and thus some of the layoffs but i wouldn't bet against lars right now he's really on top of it i haven't heard him this confident in a long time and i think they've made the company small enough still big but small enough that it's manageable they have some great stuff that i know of in the works that it's unannounced that i think people are going to love so I'm bullish on them. I love them. And it was a bittersweet thing for me to go, but it happened. I think they're a great company and I think they're really, really great people. I just feel badly. The last year has been so stressful. It's been stressful for me too. So there you have it. I mean, take that for what you will. Maybe he's just trying to pump it up a little bit here uh, because he's friends with Lars and he doesn't want to see them fail. And I mean, I, as a gamer myself, I don't want to see the Embracer group fail and just completely go away. I hope that they do turn around. I hope that they do start releasing good games and I hope there's no more of these closures and IPs being canceled. And maybe this is all a lesson learned to not try to expand so greatly and probably a lesson learned across the gaming industry, but uh, probably won't be because at the end of the day, a lot of these major companies, they see the money, they chase the money. And then when they see it not working out, they have to pull back. And then this is what happens with the overall shrinkage. All right, let's end off here with something very cool and kind of sad that this never came out, but 
Monolith Productions, they had canceled a Batman video game called Project Apollo. And this was the game that was going to have the nemesis system that we all know, we all love here from the Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War games, which are, are both very, very, very good games. But we have some footage here of what that Batman open world game potentially was going to be like with the nemesis system. So Here's what it says. Threat of videos and images related to Monolith Productions canceled Batman video game codenamed Project Apollo. It says the open world of Gotham could be tra traversed by either gliding and utilizing the grappling hook as established in the Arkham games or by operating the Tumblr slash Batmobile. And you can see kind of here the upgrade system that they had in the game, all the different things you can upgrade from your combat to your vehicle. They say that there were gadget loadouts and detective work. So go check out some of these videos. Link will be in the description, but you can see some of the missions that were here with Batman using his gadgets, as well as some of the stealth gameplay. It, again, here it says early stealth sequence and combat mechanics ladder would have been based on the Arkham system. It says the game would have marked the debut of the nemesis system mechanic where an enemies retain memories of encounters. This feature is hopefully to distinguish it from Arkham franchise, despite the other elements shared from it. And the nemesis system is awesome. If you've ever played the Mordor or, or Shadow of War game, awesome how the enemies you fight and then they have memories of you and it's just a really, really cool experience. And imagine that in a Bat Batman world, I think that would have been awesome. But Warner Brothers, who seemingly has been making very weird decisions with the great IPs that they do have, I mean, they've so far, I mean, Suicide Squad was a failure overall, at least from the perspective of what people thought about it. I don't know the exact numbers commercially, but I feel like it probably didn't sell where they wanted it to sell. So they didn't do very well with that one. And now you have here a game they could have potentially put out at some point or maybe even revitalize it and release. It probably would have done much, much better, which would have been this open world Batman game. But instead, Warner Brothers back then said that they didn't want to have two Batman gaming franchises and it was a great idea, but Batman was then retooled to Lord of the Rings project, giving the Shadow of Mordor games. I don't think it's that terrible because those games were good, but it's a shame that they completely just scrapped that open world Batman game with the Nemesis system in it. I think, honestly, if they were to take this right now, upgrade it, give it a nice new shine with the newer hardware and release it, it would win out back, I think, a lot of people if they brought that batman arkham gameplay the nemesis system a really cool open world and it would get them back on track for people being excited for their games i mean remember gotham knights you remember suicide squad just recently like i said those two overall there's been a lot of negativity surrounding them they need to really hit on their next project i think to win back that goodwill and that good faith from a lot of the fans out there but i'm gonna end the video there guys if you did enjoy this video hit that thumbs up if you're new here hit that subscribe and i'll catch you guys in the next video